For years, it's been right under our noses. The true symbol of the Illuminati. How could we have been so blind? We thought it was hidden in the ancient pyramids of Egypt, on the face of our very currency, maybe even Bill Cipher. But no, the real secret of the Illuminati has been staring back at us all along on our cereal boxes. Internet. Welcome to Food Theory, the show that takes a base of facts, supplements some logic and reason, and sprinkles on just a little tasty speculation. Welcome to part four of what is shaping out to be an ongoing series, all with the theme of the food you eat is somehow connected to a government conspiracy, which is somehow not a hyperbole, but also not the greatest name for a series of episodes. Need something catchier like the Lord of the Nutritional Hierarchy or the Food Industry, Dairy Strikes Back. Luckily, my research is better than my branding, I guess. Anyway, today we'll be piggybacking off of a discussion that started two episodes ago about why chicken nuggets exist at McDonald's, and then its follow-up episode about why we believe carrots are good for our eyesight. So if you missed either of those two episodes, well, they're not required viewing to understand today's theory, but they do set a very solid context for it. Some of you may know that I started a Diet Coke purge at the beginning of the year that's still going strong as of the time of this recording. And now I'm starting to think a lot about the kinds of food I'm eating as well, rather than, you know, the kind of pizza I'm eating tonight. Yep, tonight it's gonna be sausage, pepperoni, and spinach. Once spinach is on it, it's not pizza anymore, it's a vegetable. Even after all these years, when I think of nutritional balance, the first thing that comes to my mind is the old faithful symbol from my childhood, the food pyramid. This helpful little chart neatly outlined a whole nutritious diet in one easy to understand package. You got a basis of grains at 6 to 11 servings along the bottom, then a level of fruits and veggies at 2 to 5 servings servings a pop, the layer on top of that is proteins, separated into meats and dairies, and then all the way at the very top you have fats, sugars, and oils with the instruction to use sparingly. Healthy living achieved. Maslow's hierarchy, eat your heart out. But wait a minute, I, I know that there are lactose intolerant people, and it's not like they're malnourished, and there's a whole gluten-free movement happening right now that takes out most of your grains, which in turn removes the bottom of your pyramid. Wouldn't that cause the whole thing to collapse? Hold on, when you add up all these servings, are, are you seriously telling me that you're having as many as 25 servings of food of some kind in the course of the day? I know I'm a growing boy and all, but at some point I'm gonna start growing horizontally. So where did this thing start exactly? Well, let's go back to the early 70s. While we here in the US were busy wearing too many flower crowns and too few shoes in public places, a large portion of the world, including what we now consider affluent countries in Europe, were experiencing a food shortage. Now, this in and of itself is probably an interesting topic for another day. It's also probably where the phrase that your grandmother always uses originated from. Eat your food, kids on the other side of the world are starving. Well, we probably wouldn't say it this way anymore since it seems culturally insensitive in 2022. At the time, it was actually kind of correct. There was a huge malnutrition issue, especially in places like India and Southeast Asia, where children were disproportionately dying of nutrition-related ailments. At the time, the widespread food shortage was blamed on a few factors. First, there was general world overpopulation, which is a little funny considering that the population of the world in 1970 was half of what it is today. Next, there was a massive multi-year drought across a huge portion of Africa, and generally bad weather in other parts of the world over multiple years depleting food reserves, which today we would likely attribute to climate change. Added to that, there was even more unrest than usual in the Middle East, surrounding oil prices from OPEC, which meant that farmers literally couldn't afford the gas to run their farm equipment to save their crops that were dying in a drought. The ultimate irony of this was that in the wake of this food shortage, world governments universally agreed that in order to sustain the population in the coming years, they would need to adopt the Green Revolution, which was a movement to develop seeds that were strongly drought resistant and designed to produce a massive yield. In short, the Green Revolution, designed to solve the world's problems in the 1970s and save millions from world hunger, was to genetically modify our food. GMOs. It's a story for another day. Anyway, back to the problem at hand. Governments needed a solution that encouraged people to eat the crops that could grow during this awful production period. Enter the Food Pyramid. Not a nutritional guide based on human physiology, rather a nutritional guide based on what the heck can we put
put on grocery store shelves. One of the first countries to adopt the food pyramid structure was Sweden. Well, yes, the focus of the guide was keeping people healthy in the sense that it was designed to keep them alive and keep them from getting stuff like scurvy. The primary focus of the guide was a diet that utilized common, cheap ingredients without sacrificing necessities to pull the country through the food crisis. The Swedish food pyramid looks generally familiar at first glance, and structurally the diet did depend on each layer below. Remove all the foods in the bottom layer and everything on top doesn't really make a sustainable diet. As we look at this and other pyramids, you'll notice that bread tends to always be at the bottom. And remember, this isn't because it's scientifically the healthiest option. It's because it's calorically dense, it's easy to make, and you can make a whole lot of it with just a few ingredients. Other less intuitive base foods down here are milk and butter, cereals, and potatoes, because potatoes are just a superfood that grows well in pretty much any environment. Just ask my dark kitchen cabinets. Fruits and vegetables weren't placed in less important positions because they were scientifically worse for you, but because again, there was a major global drought and you couldn't grow them or buy them because they were too expensive. Especially when you were talking about a harsh northern climate like Sweden, where it was frozen over often and got almost no sunlight during the winter. So okay, the food pyramid's origins were a little propaganda-y, but the world's a different place now than it was in the 1970s, so as science improved, maybe the food pyramid did too. <laughs> yeah, sure. In the late 80s, the World Health Organization, or WHO, was the next to take a crack at the food pyramid. Uh, kind of. Instead of creating a pyramid, they created a food spreadsheet. Because that's what the cool kids do. No! The spreadsheet dictated that we should get 75% of our calories from carbs and about 10% from protein. Dr. Atkins would be rolling in his grave. That model managed to stick around for a while, and a few decades later it was put into the only trustworthy shape in food science, the triangle. There it is, our new food pyramid. Nice and simple, and what am I looking at? Where are my visual representations of wheat? Or my generic fish graphics? The wedge of cheese that represents dairy? This thing is like a Technicolor screensaver. Parts are fading together, free sugars is some kind of weird side slice that goes between different vertical slices, and the categories are just woefully vague. There's not even a suggestion to eat fruits and veggies on here. So good news to all you kids who ate broccoli, the World Health Organization says you don't have to eat your veggies. The artist was trying to represent the fact that you need to balance your diet differently depending on individual body types by using these stripy lines, but this thing basically fails on every conceivable front. Not to be outdone in an attempt to make eating as confusing and esoteric as possible though, the new Swedish food pyramid came back with a vengeance and presented us with two triangles. Apparently they're groups of foods that you eat separately. Cinnamon buns and Swiss cheese are not speaking to each other anymore. The two can't even be in the same pyramid together. Honestly, guys designing these things, just get a different shape. Who's holding your feet to the fire with all these triangles? Oh, but hey, at least they were making an effort to make their food pyramid based on nutritional science, in stark contrast to the United States. Before the introduction of the food pyramid, the US had some questionable dietary suggestions. The Seven Food Groups was a World War II era nutrition guide that is just bonkers. There is one category for milk and cheese, and another category entirely just for butter and margarine. An entire category for just butter and margarine. No category seems more heavily weighted, which just leaves me to understand that in order to get my requisite amount of butter, I should probably be putting it on essentially every other food category. Maybe I'll just down a few extra tablespoons for good measure. Because this came out during wartime, the driving philosophy behind the USDA food ring was to maximize the amount of calories everyone was getting, resulting in large, strong men should there ever be need for another world war, and presumably large, strong women to either step into men's roles or have really large, strong babies. Today it sounds pretty gross, but back in the day, many more jobs included manual labor, and the variety of foods was just just much lower. Obesity was barely an issue, and studies at the time indicated that malnourishment was causing stunted growth in humans. Dairy products, like butter especially, were calorically dense and delivered a wide variety of essential amino acids. Of course, the result of health guidelines like make sure you're eating a ton of butter every single day was the baby boomer generation becoming significantly more obese than any of their predecessors. Way to go, America! Way to horrendously overcorrect. By the late 80s, there was a clear need for a revamp. Based in part on the World Health 
organization's suggestions, the US was finally ready to unveil its own version of Sweden's food pyramid. So in 1991, it was blocked from coming out by the food industry because so many parts of the food industry didn't like how it looked. The grain industry lobbied hard to get refined grain products listed with the whole grain products at the base section rather than at the top of the pyramid and they succeeded. That's why even today we think of white bread and whole grain bread as being basically in the same category when really white bread is a whole lot closer to cake than it is to grains. They also managed to hide the secrets of serving sizes away in an accompanying booklet, leading people to believe that they needed huge quantities of these items to meet their daily requirements. One slice of bread, for instance, was a single serving, about 15 grams of carbs, so a sandwich would be about two servings of bread, with 6 to 11 being the daily recommended serving size, or about three sandwiches a day. But if you didn't know this, it's easy to blow things way out of proportion. For instance, if we're talking about a bowl of Olive Garden rigatoni, a serving contains 84 carbs by itself, which is almost six servings of that grain section in one bowl. And that's without even including the breadsticks, which is 25 grams of carbs in one stick. And this was just the grain industry lobby. The meat industry also had beef with the pyramid. Get it? Beef with the pyramid? They asked that the colors of the blocks be changed so that meat didn't wind up as red, because they were worried that people would associate red with a warning and would thus stay away from meat as a result. Dairy managed to pull a fast one when they pointed out that processed cheese was less nutritional than natural cheese, and that you would need twice as many servings for processed cheese, which allowed them to increase their overall serving sizes. With just those examples, you can see how the whole process broke down pretty darn quickly with all this industry propaganda. Nonetheless, in 1992, the USDA published their Food Guide Pyramid, and it rapidly infested grade schools across the country. If you grew up during this time period, it seemed like the Food Pyramid was up there with the Pledge of Allegiance. It was something that you could count on, but in reality, it was just riddled with flaws. Also, at this point, the pyramid structure just loses all its meaning. Rather than the original pyramid structure, where the food on the bottom was the most important, it was the basis of a healthy diet. This version just used the size of each layer to indicate vague serving size recommendations. And even that didn't really work, since fruits and vegetables were on the same horizontal line, but you were supposed to have more vegetables than fruit. By 2005, the Food Guide Pyramid's flaws were just way too obvious to ignore in the face of mounting evidence against the use of unsaturated fats in processed foods, and the relationship between refined carbs and chronic illnesses like diabetes. Without having a whole new pyramid ready to go, the government took to their second favorite tactic for dealing with issues, obfuscate, confuse everyone. After recalibrating the serving sizes, the USDA published the My Pyramid, which just tells me what exactly? Less of all food types if I live at a higher altitude? They were literally like, what if we just turn the triangle the other way and just let people interpret the thing however they want? Like some sort of modern art piece. Maybe they thought the vertical stripes were slimming and everyone would feel better about their diet because of the optical illusion. Thankfully, the back side of the poster reveals exact serving sizes, which does clarify things, except for the fact that some of them are in ounces and some of them are in cups, which means that the USDA is measuring some foods via weight and other foods via their volume. The secondhand embarrassment from this thing is just so bad. Luckily, this one only stuck around for eight years. This is the best they had to offer for eight years. It eventually evolved into the much clearer, my plate. This version at least specifically focuses on proportions of what you should be eating, making it clear that no single food group supports the entire diet. Vegetables take up about the same amount of room as grains, with fruit and protein taking a kind of ambiguous second place. It's definitely better, but again, the My Plate system isn't without its flaws, as not even a circle can escape lobbying corruption. In this model, we're still lumping refined flour crackers in with whole wheat and rye crackers. We're even recommending more of them. The My Plate also contained four main food groups. Fruits, grains, vegetables, and proteins. Yep, that sounds like a healthy diet, but where's dairy? Maybe they didn't include dairy because it's not an essential part of your diet, because it isn't. Oh wait, it's up there in that little circle, that milk glass over on the side. It had to be included because Big Dairy insisted it be included. Mmm, Big Dairy. But you know, that's a story for another day. So here we are, 2022. What's a guy have to do around here to get an accurate food pyramid? Or you know what, doesn't have to be a pyramid. Any reliable food food shape whatsoever? Well, my friends, the answer to that is ask a scientist, or at least a group that's less influenced by the tides of various food industries across the country, because they already have themselves an endowment that's bigger than the GDP of Latvia. That's right, friends. Turns out that after all this 
stumbles the various government entities have made with their food rhomboids or whatever they've got going on. Nutritional experts from leading academic institutions have come up with some nutritional systems of their own. Take for example Harvard's Healthy Eating Pyramid, which starts at the base not with food, but with actions. Moderate portions, exercise, and health monitoring all sit as the basis for a real healthy eating lifestyle, which hasn't shown up on any food pyramid that we've seen yet, but seems intuitive when you think about it. Your nutrition is certainly part of being healthy, but it's all related to the things that you do with your body once you've fueled it with food. On top of that, you have equal allotments of vegetables and whole grains, not refined grains, showing the foods that you need to supply lasting energy and fiber alongside healthy fats in the middle as a small portion. The next level up is pretty evenly divided across what type of protein you prefer. Nuts, chicken, fish. A very moderate one to two servings of dairy, which can be replaced entirely by just taking a vitamin D supplement. And finally, high cholesterol and high sugar foods like white bread, sweets, and beef sitting at the very top for eating on special occasions. While some people might kind of flip more protein in or a few fewer grains or whatever, this seems like a much more moderate and better proportioned system based on what we scientifically know about food now. And it's all built on that solid foundation of activity level and your own monitoring. In short, the moral of today's story, friends, is this. Check the biases and ulterior motives of where you're getting your information from. Some people just want to educate you so you can lead a healthier, happier life. Other people want you to pump yourself so full of butter that you become a super soldier for the inevitable World War III. Meanwhile, I personally will be following this food guide, the Food Trophy, where this quadrant is KFC knockoff original recipe, this quadrant is various preparations of Christmas tree, this quadrant is all about McDonald's medium fries because they're the most cost efficient, and this last quadrant is still empty because I haven't found anything to replace Diet Coke. Iced tea, man. Good, but just doesn't give me the feels like that sweet, sweet DC. Anyway, it's all just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit. Let's be honest, all these various food shapes fail to address the biggest issue that comes with maintaining a nutritious diet, actually obtaining said food. As much as I'd love to prepare a healthy meal with whole grains and green and yellow vegetables all the time, Time. Sometimes hitting the drive through is all I've got the energy for. And something tells me that whatever they're throwing into those Taco Bell wings doesn't qualify as a healthy fat. Which is why I turn to Grubhub, who, conveniently enough, is sponsoring today's episode, and who's also offering you $5 off your order of $15 or more if you happen to be one of the first 5,000 people to click the link in the top line of the description. When you do that, make sure you use the code Food Theorist to get that $5 discount. Grubhub is my absolute go-to food delivery service. Why, Matt Pat? Well, that's a great question there, hypothetical viewer. It's because of the Grubhub guarantee. Essentially, Grubhub guarantees that you'll get your food delivered for the lowest price and on time, which is clutch for someone with a three-year-old and a hangry streak. So picture this, 8 p.m., you're knee-deep in Swedish food pyramid research. Your stomach chimes in, not now, tummy. Yes, now, says tummy. So you open up your handy-dandy Grubhub app and see that you can get tacos at your house in under 40 minutes. Your stomach splits off into its own being, grabs your phone, punches you square in the jaw and places the order. Okay, that might be a slight exaggeration of events, but you did order the tacos because you knew with the Grubhub guarantee that those tacos would really be at the front door in the 40 minutes specified. And guess what? You are right. They did show up. Your stomach was put at ease and now you're free to put all your energy back into figuring out what in the world the Who Food Guidelines was trying to say. Because seriously, I still don't have a clear understanding of what it's trying to communicate. Finally, as an extra bonus, Grubhub has been gracious enough to offer $5 off your order to the first 5,000 people to click the link down in the description and use the code FOODTHEORIST, F-O-O-D-T-H-E-O-R-I-S-T. Take advantage of that Grubhub guarantee right now before your stomach punches you in the face. And as always, bon appetit!